All right. I think in the interest of time, we have a fair bit to cover. I am sure there will be a few people that will join um, in the next few minutes, but I think we can get started. Um, so welcome, everybody. Um, thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, my name is Aidan Baker, and I use she, her pronouns. Uh, I'm a white woman with shorter length blonde hair, and I am sitting in front of a Zoom background um, that has the logo for the Learning Acceleration Challenges in the background. Uh, I'm an engagement manager at Luminary Labs, um, and I know we had some questions about Luminary Labs um, before today's session. So we are an innovation consultancy based in New York, uh, and we have been engaged by the Institute of Education Sciences to run the Learning Acceleration Challenges. So we are incredibly thrilled to have you all here today. Uh, the purpose of today's session is to provide an overview of the Learning Acceleration Challenges, including the focus areas, uh, the selection criteria, and the participation requirements. We will be discussing both the math prize and the science prize in today's session. Uh, we will then have a Q&A at the end of the session and um, we'll be using the Q&A function in Zoom. So if you do have questions as we're talking, um, feel free to share them in the Zoom box at the bottom of um, your Zoom window um, and we'll get back to those um, during the Q&A session at the end. We'll also be publishing uh, answers to the questions that we received today by the FAQ section on challenge.gov. Um, so if you haven't already, um, we really recommend that you follow the challenges on challenge.gov to receive updates when those answers are posted. If you missed it at the beginning, um, we are also recording today's session and we'll also be sharing a copy of the slides. Uh, next slide. And then just quickly, out of interest, if you're curious about who else is here today, um, you should be able to see the results of the poll on your screen now. Um, so interesting, it looks like a, a pretty even split actually of kind of math, science and interested in both. Um, and then looking at the types of organizations, um, great to see lots of intervention providers here today, as well as some folks from research and policy organizations. Um, and it looks like a fair few of you fall into the other group as well. So interested to know who's there, um, but thanks so much for joining. All right, so today we are also really pleased to be joined um, by staff from the Institute of Education Sciences, um, including Dr. Joe McLaughlin, Commissioner of the National Center for Special Education and Research, as well as Dr. Ma Matthew Soldner, Commissioner of the National Center for Education Evaluation and Regional Assistance. Uh, so Joan and Matt, I'm gonna pass it over to you to introduce yourselves and then also share a little bit more about the challenges. Joan, you're on mute. Thank you. All right, let's try that again. Um, I, I'm so glad to be with you uh, today and uh, to kick off this, uh, this challenge uh, activity with, uh, with a webinar. I am a white woman with short light brown hair and I have on a dark ruffled shirt. My pronouns are she and her. And I want to identify two other staff members for the from the National Center for Special Education Research, or NICSER, as we call ourselves. One is Sarah Brazel, who is in the meeting. And another is Britta Brasina, who just delivered a baby a few days ago. So she won't be joining us today, but hopefully will be involved uh, in, in fairly short order. OK, Matt? Hey, thanks, Joan. Uh, hey, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is uh, Matt Soldner. I'm a white man with a very, very short uh, light brown hair, and I'm wearing a, a blue blazer. Uh, my pronoun uh, are, are he and him. Um, in addition to myself, I want to recognize a, another colleague who is on the phone with us today from IES, Christina Chin from our National Center for Education Research. Uh, she'll also be working with us on the Science Prize. So okay. Let, yeah. Go ahead. So sorry, Matt. No problem. No problem. Um, so let me just again give you all my welcome, our welcome from the Institute of Education Sciences. If you are not familiar with us, we are the Department of Education's Research, Evaluation, and Statistics branch, and we are really thrilled to have been able to launch the Learning Acceleration Challenges to identify and to test intervention to improve both math and science achievement. Uh, we are running two concurrent challenges, as you know, the math prize and the science prize. 
And over the next few slides, um, Joan and I are going to share more about each challenge. And we'll begin, I believe, with the math prize. Yes, but first I want to talk about the overall question uh, is why IES is running these challenges now. Um, mastering foundational math and science competencies in early elementary and, or middle elementary and middle school is crucial for future learning. These competencies are also crucial for navigating an increasingly technological world. Even before the COVID-19 pandemic, many students, particularly students with disabilities and other students historically underserved by educational systems, faced barriers to attaining these skills. Now, with three school years already impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic, the need for evidence-based and scalable interventions is greater than ever. With this in mind, the Math Prize is seeking specifically uh, for school-based digital interventions to significantly improve math outcomes for upper elementary school students with or at risk for disabilities that affect math performance. Interventions should specifically focus on fractions, although they can also include prerequisite skills for fractions, such as whole numbers and operations. Eden will be sharing more details about the, the prize uh, later in this presentation. But I would also um, just like um, to put out um, a statement about the real need for uh, impactful math interventions. Um, what, what does this mean in real terms? So if we look at the recent scores on the National Assessment of Educational Progress from 2019, we see that 54% of fourth graders with disabilities scored below Nate Basic in mathematics compared with only 15% of their peers without disabilities. I want to repeat that because the impact is, is pretty um, apparent. 54% of fourth graders with disabilities scored below Nate Basic. So um, closing this achievement gap is particularly important. Um, and as I alluded to um, uh, previously, uh, the, the skills that are learned early on are critical to advancing in math. They're foundational, fractions are foundational concepts. Um, and uh, along with things like um, whole numbers and operations, they help students succeed in more advanced math. Oh, okay, Matt. Thanks, Joan. So the Science Prize, uh, the companion prize here, is intended to spur the creation of interventions that address needs for science learning. Um, specifically, we are seeking interventions that significantly improve science outcome for middle school students with low performance in science. And unlike the Math Prize, the intervention may be digital, it may be non-digital, or it may be hybrid, and it can be designed for implementation at school um, and importantly, it may also be used in out of school time programs. And much like Joan, we have information from our National Session of Educational Progress that documents just what a significant need this truly is. Um, and really why we believe a need for high quality, high impact science interventions for middle grade students um, truly is acute. In 2019, over 33% of students in eighth grade performed below NAEP basic in science. And this achievement gap only widens um, by the end of high school, over 40% of 12th graders perform below NAEP basic. And so we really strongly believe that early intervention in these middle school years is needed to ensure that all students can meet science proficiency benchmarks before graduation. So you may be wondering if you are in the uh, half or so of you who said you were intervention providers who are on the line today, uh, what are the benefits for me? Um, we believe that both of these challenges, both the science and the math prize, present exciting opportunities for providers 
that have evidence-based interventions in these areas. And here are three uh, benefits that come readily to mind. So the first is the opportunity to really test your intervention with students and gain valuable data about its effectiveness. Our partners NWEA will be conducting an evaluation of the selected interventions in phase two, which we will share a lot more about later on in today's session. Um, the second is a chance to win monetary prizes. The total prize pool is $1.8 million across both challenges. That works out to be $850,000 for the math prize and $950,000 for the science prize. Um, and third and finally, um, all finalists will have access to resources and to expert guidance about how to do high quality impact and cost evaluation. So this is a great opportunity for provider teams to build capacity of staff working on the project. There are also clear benefits for participating schools. Uh, schools will get access to innovative interventions for students, particularly those who are often underserved. And it's also an important opportunity to, for schools to build the evidence base about what works in different settings and for different students. This will con contribute to our broader understanding of what types of interventions are effective, how they can be approved, and how they can be scaled. We are really excited about um, these challenge prizes. We have been working um, over the last uh, several months on uh, every aspect of the prizes. And uh, today marks a, a, a great milestone for us. And we hope that um, we can share our enthusiasm with you um, uh, about uh, competing in this uh, exciting endeavor and to really make the difference uh, for students who um, have been underrepresented uh, in, in uh, education systems in the past. Okay, now I'm gonna turn it back to Eden for some um, nitty gritty uh, details. Thanks so much, Sharon. And I will echo the excitement from the IES team. Um, we are really excited about these two challenges um, and thrilled to have you all here today. Uh, so as Joan said, I am gonna get into the nitty gritty about the challenges. Um, so review the timeline, um, the selection criteria and prizes amongst a few other things. So taking a look at the challenge structure. Um, so both prizes, the math and science prize are being run concurrently uh, and follow the same timeline. Um, both prizes will be conducted in two phases. So we are in the first phase now, um, which is intervention design. Uh, so submissions opened on August 4 uh, and will close on September 30 at 5.59 p.m. Eastern. Uh, judging will then take place throughout October and we plan to announce finalists in early November. Then in the second phase, uh, which is called implementation and evaluation, selected finalists will implement their interventions at partner schools um, in the math or science prize or out of school time programs uh, in the science prize only. At the end of the implementation period, finalists will need to submit um, specific student and school level, level data uh, to support the evaluation, as well as information as part of their phase two submissions. And I'll share a little bit more about um, what this entails and what type of data um, that will be required uh, a little later in today's session. Phase two judging will then take place uh, throughout July and August, and we anticipate announcing the um, phase two winners in September, 2023. So building a little bit on uh, what Joan shared earlier, uh, I'm gonna share more about the focus of the math prize as well as the eligible students. Uh, so as Joan mentioned, uh, for the math prize, the proposed intervention must be school-based and digital. And for the purpose of this challenge, we are defining a school-based intervention as one that is primarily implemented as part of the regular school schedule and in a setting that is under the control of a public or private K-12 school, alternative school, or similar entity that is a component of the US education system. And then we are defining digital interventions as those that provide instruction and practice through student use of a digital device, such as a computer, a laptop, or a mobile. Uh, interventions should specifically focus on fractions and can also include the prerequisite skills such as whole numbers and operations as defined in the state standards for grades three to five. And the one additional thing to note here is that instructional practices should align with the best practices outlined in the IES practice guide, assisting students struggling with mathematics intervention in the elementary grades. Uh, and you can find this on the IES website. We've also added a link to this on the um, math prize listing on challenge.gov. 
Uh, for the math prize, eligible students are those in the third, fourth, and or fifth grades with or at risk for a disability that affects math performance. Uh, students may be identified as having a disability or being at risk for a disability that affects math performance if they have an IEP with goals related to math, uh, are enrolled in a tier two or tier three intervention in a multi-tiered system of support, or are identified through another well-defined process that is used by a school. Examples of these um, types of alternative identification processes uh, may include things like performance on state testing, uh, school grades, and uh, things like teacher referrals. And one important thing to note here too is that intervention providers can provide the intervention to all students in a class or a group, um, but only data for eligible students will be included in NWA's evaluation. So moving on to the focus of the science prize, uh, so building on what Matt shared earlier. Uh, so for this prize, the proposed intervention should align with the framework for K-12 science education from the National Research Council. As Matt noted, interventions may be digital, non-digital or hybrid, and you can see specifically how these terms are defined uh, on challenge.gov. Interventions for this challenge may be school-based or designed for implementation in out-of-school time programs. And for the purposes of this challenge, an out-of-school time intervention is one that is primarily implemented at a program that occurs before or after the regular school day. Importantly, out-of-school time intervention should be aligned to a formal program of learning that is under the control of a public or private K-12 school, alternative school, or similar entity that is a component of the US education system. And then for the science prize, eligible students are those in the sixth, seventh, and or eighth grades who score in the bottom 25th percentile based on the NWEA map growth science assessment national norms. One important flag here is that IES does encourage interventions that meet the needs of all students, including students with or at risk for disabilities. And then as with the math prize, intervention providers can provide the intervention to all students in a class or a group, but again, only data for the eligible students will be considered as part of the evaluation. So building on the timeline that they shared, I'm now going to go through each phase in more detail. So starting with phase one, um, during this phase, which we're in now, uh, intervention providers will be invited to submit proposals for interventions that align with the focus areas that I just outlined. Uh, submissions close on September 30, and I'll be sharing a little bit more about the submission process later in today's session. As mentioned, uh, intervention providers will need to ensure students at their partner schools have taken the NWA MAP growth assessment by November 1. So this is really important to consider um, when you're looking at your partner schools. And I'll also share a little bit more about this process uh, later in today's session. Eligible submissions will then be evaluated by a panel of judges and up to five uh, finalists per challenge will be selected to participate in phase two and implement their proposed interventions. I saw we had a question in the Q&A already about um, support available. Um, so in phase one, all entrants will have access to technical assistance to help them prepare their submissions. Uh, and there are a few components to this. Um, so the first is guiding documents. Um, these are all available on challenge.gov now. Uh, and these documents provide information on randomized control trials, um, data collection, and what you'll be expected to do if you're selected to progress to phase two, um, as well as other participation requirements. In addition to today's webinar, we are also hosting two webinars with subject matter experts. Uh, the first is all about setting up a randomized control trial, uh, and that is next Tuesday, August 23rd at three o'clock. Uh, and then the second is all about how to conduct the cost analysis uh, and how to think about implementation planning. Uh, and that is the following Tuesday, August 30 at three o'clock. Uh, and I believe my colleague Naomi has just popped a link in the chat um, for where you can sign up for both of those webinars. Uh, links for these are also on challenge.gov. And then following these webinars, um, the subject matter experts will also be hosting office hours. Um, so these sessions will really be an opportunity for you to ask any specific follow-up questions you might have after the, the two sessions. Uh, and updates on how to sign up for these will be shared via challenge.gov shortly. So looking at the selection criteria, uh, at the end of phase one, judges will score eligible submissions against the phase one criteria for a maximum of 35 points. Uh, there are five criteria in phase one. Uh, impact and implementation plan are both worth 10 points. Scalability aligned to student needs and team are all worth five. 
In the interest of time, I am not going to read through all of these, um, but they are all available on challenge.gov. So I encourage you to review them closely. And then looking at science, um, the criteria here are very similar um, with some small differences, um, specifically in the impact criterion and also the aligned to student needs criterion. Again, I will not read through all of them, but I encourage you to review these on challenge.gov. Uh, and again, there should be a link to, to both of those pages in the chat. And then looking at phase one awards. So as I mentioned at the end of phase one, uh, up to five finalists in the math prize will be selected to progress to phase two. Um, each finalist will receive $25,000. And then as with the math prize, at the end of phase one, up to five finalists will be selected to progress to phase two of the science prize. And again, each finalist will receive $25,000. So moving on to phase two, I will now go through um, some of the specifics here. So as um, we've mentioned in phase two, finalists will implement their interventions either at schools or at out of school time programs under routine conditions. Uh, the duration of the interventions may vary, um, but they must be implemented uh, between November, 2022 and April, 2023. Um, as we've mentioned, students will take the NWA map growth assessment at the, at the beginning of the implementation period and then again at the end of the implement, implementation period. Um, and this needs to be done before May 1st, 2023. NWA will use these assessment results as well as student level and school level data and cost data um, to prepare evaluation reports that describe the efficacy and cost effectiveness of each intervention. These evaluation reports, as well as additional information uh, provided by intervention providers as part of their phase two submissions, were reviewed by a panel of judges against the phase two selection criteria. And so sharing a little bit more about the data that I mentioned. So if you are selected as a finalist, you will be required to work with your partner schools to collect two types of data to support the evaluation. Uh, the first is student level and school level data, and the second is cost data. So looking at that first category, at the start of phase two, you'll be, you will need to work with your schools to collect information on each student's teacher, classroom, school assignment, and eligibility. Then at the end of phase two, you'll need to work with your schools to collate and share information on each student's engagement with the intervention. So this includes things like any changes in the random assignment. To learn more about um, these requirements and sort of some detail around the randomized control trial, I recommend that you sign up for next week's webinar. There are also some resources that I mentioned earlier, um, the guiding documents that are available on challenge.gov. And then for the cost data, you will need to collect and share data about the cost of your intervention. Um, this includes things like personnel time, such as how long staff spent preparing for or implementing the intervention, and non-personnel research resources. So things like the cost of materials, software licenses, and equipment. And then in addition to this data, NWA will also have access to the assessment scores. Um, and this will be used to evaluate the impact of the intervention and will be shared, as I mentioned, with judges as part of the scoring for phase two. So looking at the technical assistance for phase two, um, all finalists will have access to personalized support to help them with this data collection, as well as any other challenges that may arise. At the start of phase two, uh, Luminary Labs will host an onboarding webinar for all finalists. And this will include an overview of phase two, things like specific dates and milestones and any other um, participation requirements. All finalists will also receive personalized support from apt associate subject matter experts. So during monthly calls with this team, uh, finalists will be able to discuss their progress and troubleshoot any challenges that they may be experiencing with regards to data collection or implementation or, or anything else that may arise. Uh, specific topics will vary based on finalists need, uh, but we expect it will include uh, guidance around things like identifying implementation measures, so things like dosage, participation and attendance, uh, using student rosters and also collecting cost data. These monthly hour-long calls will be conducted by a video conference uh, throughout the implementation period. So looking at the phase two selection criteria, 
uh, as I mentioned, at the end of phase two, judges will review the evaluation reports as well as the phase two submissions against these criteria. In this case, cost effectiveness and impact are worth 10 points and scalability and sustainability are worth five for a total of 30 points. Uh, again, these criteria are available on challenge.gov. And then looking at the science prize, um, the science prize will follow the same review process, but we'll have a separate judging panel. Uh, again, the criteria are very similar with a few minor differences. So I would recommend you take a closer look on challenge.gov. And so then looking at phase two awards. Uh, so for the math prize, up to three winners will be selected. For the grand prize, $500,000 will be awarded to one intervention that demonstrates a statistically significant effect size at or above a 0.77 effect size threshold. This intervention will also need to receive a minimum score uh, against the phase two selection criteria. If more than one intervention exceeds the threshold, the grand prize will be awarded to the intervention with the highest score against the phase two criteria. For the first prize of 150,000, uh, this will be awarded based on the finalist total scores against the phase two criteria. And then one runner up will receive at least 75,000. This prize will also be based on final scores against the phase two criteria. One thing to note here is that each finalist can only receive one prize. So if a finalist is eligible for two prizes, they will receive the larger of the two. Uh, and then as with the math prize, up to three prize winners will be selected for the science prize. Uh, for the grand prize, 500,000 will be awarded to one intervention that demonstrates a st statistically significant effect size at or above a 0.4 effect size threshold. Um, as with the math prize, this intervention will also need to receive a minimum score against the phase two criteria. For the first prize, one finalist will receive at least $150,000. If the first prize winner is an out of school time intervention, they will receive 250,000 instead of 150. And then as with the math prize, one runner up will receive at least $75,000. Okay, and then as mentioned, I wanted to provide a brief overview of how to enter um, before we open it up for a Q&A. So entrants are required to submit the following four files as part of their submission. Uh, so the first is an entrant overview, uh, which should be one page. And this must include a brief description of the entrant type, uh, as well as if the, individual is an, if the entrant is an individual, uh, written confirmation that you are at least 18 years old, and also a citizen or permanent resident of the United States. And if it is an entity, written confirmation that the entity is registered or incorporated in accordance with the applicable laws and maintains a primary place of business in the United States. Uh, this is really important for um, us to be able to confirm your eligibility for the challenge. And I encourage you to take a closer look at the eligibility requirements, which are in the rules, terms and conditions on challenge.gov. The second upload is a letter of commitment from school districts or charter private school networks um, that you will partner with. Uh, so these districts must be conducting the NWA map growth assessment in fall 2022 and spring 2023 in order um, for us to be able to get the, the student growth data that I mentioned earlier. You can find a letter of commitment uh, template on challenge.gov. One thing to note here is that there are different templates for each prize. Uh, and then also for the science prize, there are two, di two different templates. Uh, so the first is for school-based interventions, and then the second is for out-of-school time interventions. So just make sure you're using the right template there. Uh, the third file upload is the school acknowledgement. Uh, and this should match the list of schools that are included in the letter of commitment from the districts or network. Uh, again, there is a school acknowledgement template on challenge.gov, um, and you'll need to work with your partner, school districts or networks to circulate this with participating schools. And then the final upload is the intervention proposal. Uh, and so there are a few specific things that this should include. Uh, an overview of your intervention, including its focus, um, mode of delivery and necessary equipment. Uh, empirical and or theoretical evidence to demonstrate the potential for the intervention to significantly improve math or science outcomes. A description of eligible students that the intervention will support, including how it has been designed to meet their specific needs. 
a description of how the intervention could be scaled to support additional students beyond the challenge. Uh, and this should also include anticipated cost per student. And then an implementation plan. Um, and this really needs to detail specifics such as uh, sample size goals and random assignment plan, uh, recommended dosage and duration, uh, the number of teachers and other staff who will participate, uh, the types of professional development and uh, training that these staff will receive, the provision of technology and other necessary equipment, uh, your plan for gathering data, so the student and school level data that I mentioned, as well as the cost data, and then also risk mitigation contingency plans. So for things like, hopefully not, but things like school closures or any other kind of delays that, that might happen in phase two. Uh, and then finally, a team description, uh, which includes an overview of your team members and their relevant experience. So I know that was a lot of information. Uh, I wanna open up for questions. I can see we've already got quite a few through the Q&A window here. Um, we also received quite a few questions by the Eventbrite registration before today's session. So we're going to start with those questions. I encourage you to keep asking questions via the Q&A window uh, and we will get to as many as we can today live. If we don't get to your question live, um, we will also be publishing, as I mentioned, written responses to all of the questions on challenge.gov, um, and we will share by email when these are live. So to start, um, we are going to go through some of the questions that we received before today's session. Um, so one of the questions that we got a lot, and I think this is a very common question around open innovation challenges, is that how do these differ from grants? And then also what is the rationale for doing an open innovation challenge as opposed to a grant? So I'm going to, to take a pass at the first half of that question, and then I'll pass it over to the IES team to share a little bit more about their rationale. So just for context in terms of what a challenge actually is, um, a challenge allows the public to solve problems presented by federal agencies and receive awards for the best solutions. Um, and challenges tend to be a little bit more open than other funding mechanisms that you might be used to, like grants and contracts. Um, they typically define a smaller set of requirements, which allows participants to bring more of their own creativity to solutions. One really important distinction is that by challenges by design, do not place any restrictions on how prize funds are used. So the funds awarded through this innovation challenge are not subject to the same reporting requirements as funds awarded through grant programs. There's a little bit of an overview of, of challenges. Um, I'm now going to pass it over to Matt to just share a little bit more of IES's rationale for structuring this as a challenge as opposed to a traditional grant. Yeah, thanks. Eden. So uh, some of you may know in recent years, um, IES has been growing the number and types of tools it uses to encourage innovation. And challenges have been one part of that effort. Uh, for example, one uh, currently underway is our digital learning challenge which will enable experiments of frequency and scope and scale that aren't typically possible through traditional methods used in education research or commercial ed tech practices. Um, one recently completed challenge um, focused on automated scoring of NAEP um, is a good example. If you want more information on our use of challenges and kind of the larger strategy, um, I'd commend to you a blog um, written by our director, Mark Schneider, I believe, our colleagues are going to drop a link to that blog in the chat so you can check it out. You know, through this challenge in math and science, we seek to more rapidly identify high impact, effective interventions that schools can implement to address the needs of historically underserved students. Great. Thanks, Matt. Uh, we also received quite a few questions around eligibility. Uh, so the first one was, are small businesses eligible to apply? Um, the short answer here is yes. Uh, so entrants may be individuals, uh, teams of individuals or entities. Uh, and I mentioned this before, but to be eligible entities must be registered or incorporated in accordance with applicable laws uh, and maintain a primary place of business in the United States. Uh, and again, I would suggest you take a closer look at eligibility requirements in the rules, terms and conditions on challenge.gov. Um, but as I said, short answer is yes, small businesses are eligible to apply. The other question we received via Eventbrite around eligibility um, was, we are the recipient of an IES grant, are we still eligible to apply? Uh, and I'm going to pass that one over to Joan from IES. And I remembered to take myself off mute. 
um, which is always a plus. Um, so um, the short answer to this is yes, you're still eligible eligible to participate in the challenge, provided that you meet the other requirements of the challenge. However, um, you should disclose whether your intervention has been or is currently being funded as part of an efficacy trial, whether it's IES or any other agency. Um, you should put that in your implementation plan as part of your phase one submission. I also want to note um, that if you are conducting an efficacy trial during the 22-23 school year that is being funded by the IES or other federal agency grant, you must implement your intervention in different schools from the challenge schools um, uh, separately from, from what you would uh, do as part of, of the grant. I hope that's clear. Thanks, Joan. Uh, we got a question uh, via Eventbrite, but I think we've also received a very similar question live today, which was how did IES set the effect size thresholds for the grand prize? Uh, so for that one, I'm going to pass it over to Matt from IES. All right, so the objective of the learning acceleration challenges is to substantially accelerate growth in student performance in uh, math and science outcomes. And the effect size we're looking for the grand prize are commensurately large. Um, the thresholds used for the grand prize are 0.77 in math and 0.4 in science. These represent about twice the expected annual growth in the achievement measure used in the challenge, which is truly an aspirational benchmark. Um, we hope this will encourage um, and sufficiently reward innovators um, and innovative thinking that results in truly substantial improvements uh, in student learning. Thanks, Matt. Uh, and then another question you received around prizes um, was, if we are a team, how will prize funds be distributed to team members? Uh, so uh, essentially prize awards will be issued in a single payment to the individual team lead or lead entity indicated on the submission. So again, this is why it's really important to include that overview um, as part of your upload. Any further distribution of funds to team members is essentially at the discretion of the team lead and is not the responsibility of IES or challenge administrators. Uh, moving on to a couple of other questions we received before today. Um, uh, we had a few about specifics of phase one. Uh, so this one here, are teacher-focused solutions permitted for the science prize, uh, including things like curriculum and professional teacher professional development, or does the solution need to be focused on students exclusively? Uh, and Matt, I will hand that one over to you. Sure. So uh, the, the prize, uh, the science prize seeks to recognize an intervention that can, over the course really of less than a full academic year, uh, dramatically accelerate student growth and science achievement. And as described on challenge.gov, the interventions should be designed to be delivered primarily to the student. Um, while success will be measured by growth in student achievement, we do obviously recognize the need for teacher engagement as well. I and mean, in particular, we do hypothesize that effective interventions should include teacher engagement to effectively implement their solution. And so that includes, but isn't limited to teacher professional development. Um, but again, uh, it is designed to be delivered primarily to the student. Thanks, Matt. Uh, and then another one we had around phase one submission. So is this prize designed to support developing completely new interventions, evaluating existing interventions, or potentially both? Um, so that's a really good question. Uh, given the short timeline, we are anticipating that entrants will have an existing intervention. Uh, and this is really to ensure that selected entrants are able to implement their interventions in phase two um, from November 2022 until April 2023. Uh, in saying that, entrants may adapt an existing intervention to meet, you know, the specific needs of eligible students in each challenge. So, for example, incorporating specific accommodations uh, to support students with a uh, risk for a disability that affects math performance. We also received some specific questions around phase two. 
Uh, so one was around judging um, and who will be on the judging panel. Uh, so each challenge will have a separate judging panel. So there'll be one for the math prize and one for the science prize. Uh, and each panel will be made up of a mix of, of judges with different relevant expertise um, across areas such as ed tech, uh, students with disabilities uh, and implementation for the math prize. And then areas such as assessments, uh, cost analysis and science content for the science prize. Uh, and we will, we will be publishing more about each judging panel uh, sometime shortly. Uh, we also had another question around phase two, which is how um, outcomes based on fractions performance um, and whether they'll be assessed on the map or on the overall uh, score um, using the NWA assessment. Uh, so the efficacy evaluation for the prize will be based on students' overall score on the NWA map growth assessment in spring 2023 as compared to their overall score, score in fall 2022. I know we've also received a couple of questions live um, about the math prize specifically. Um, so one was, why is the math prize focused specifically on fractions? Uh, Joan, I will pass that over to you to share a little bit more context um, from IES. So, um, yeah, I, I think um, I, I mentioned it when I was uh, talking in uh, through the um, through the our slides. Um, you know, really fra fractions are a foundational concept for higher level math. And fourth grade is where the US curriculum begins to increase its focus on rational numbers with a focus in particular on fractions. Um, so it's important for students to gain these skills, to become more fluent in them before they hit the middle grades, uh, uh, grades six through eight, where al algebra becomes the curriculum's, curriculum's primary focus. So. You know, it's true in school that there are that they um, fractions are the foundations for higher level math, but mastering fractions is also critical for um, future careers and just an independent living. Um, surveys of adults have shown that most employees use fractions in their jobs, and they're relevant for many life skills, including personal finance, cooking, and healthcare. Uh, therefore, the, the notion is that uh, there are long-term serious implications for children who do not develop an understanding of fractions and an ability to solve problems that involve them. Um, fractions is an area where there has been a large investment in research, uh, in, including in Nixer, with um, evidence of instructional practices which um, have been outlined in the math practice guide that recently came out out of the National Center for Education Evaluation and Regional Assistance. So that's one of the reasons why we are pointing potential applicants uh, to the, to, for the math prize to um, review the practice guide to determine the alignment um, of their practices used in the digital solution with what's in the practice guide. Great, thank you, Joan. Uh, we have also received several questions specifically about matching with schools and districts that are already using the NWA map growth assessment. Uh, so we're not able to provide a list of districts, but NWA um, can assist intervention providers who are looking for partner schools. Um, so we suggest you email uh, the NWA team. Um, we'll share a link in the chat to that email address. Uh, and when you do so, um, please include a list of 10 school districts or private uh, school networks um, that you would like to potentially match with. And then we do ask that you do so by September 1, 2022, just to make sure they have plenty of time to be able to look into potential match and then also for you, be, for you to be able to get the necessary commitments. Uh, and as I said, I think my colleague Naomi has just popped in the chat the link to that email address um, so that you can follow up with the team there. Uh, we also received a question uh, kind of related to, to another one that we answered previously, um, which is specifically about why the math prize is focused on digital interventions. Uh, so Joan, I'm going to pass that one over to you as well. Okay. Um, so the whole idea behind the focus on digital interventions is that there is a real need within the field for scalable approaches to mathematic intervention. 
uh, using technology. Um, this is becoming even uh, more um, important as we see the teacher shortages, uh, especially in the area in, of special education. Um, we, we want to um, provide uh, teachers with some support using digital in, um, uh, interventions to support students and help them um, improve their um, fraction fluency. Um, so um, uh, the other thing is that um, while it, it's a focus on, um, on uh, digital uh, interventions, we also know that teachers are going to play an important part of this. And so um, thinking about the teacher, I, I mean, so I, I think the, the focus certainly is on the student, but um, we understand that the teacher, an interventionist, or a parent may have a role in the digital math intervention implementation by doing things like monitoring progress, providing student feedback, and making any adjustments allowable uh, given the affordances of the digital tool and the needs of the student. Thank you, Joan. Uh, we have also received a few questions that are specifically around uh, what is required as part of a phase one submission. So um, I covered this a little bit in, in the presentation, but just a reminder. So as part of submissions, entrants will need to provide two documents. Uh, so the first is a letter of commitment from school districts or charter or private school networks that they are going to partner with. Um, and the template for this is available on challenge.gov. Um, and the second is the school acknowledgement. So as I mentioned, this um, should match the list of schools that are in the letter of commitment um, and each individual school will need to populate this. So you'll need to circulate it with each um, representative or school leader to fill in their respective information. Um, and again, there is a template for this on challenge.gov. Uh, we also had a couple of related questions. So one was whether you can include links in the um, submission or the intervention proposal. Um, links uh, can be included, but we cannot guarantee they will be reviewed by judges. We also had a follow-up question around prizes. Um, so we touched on this a little bit um, with the, the question about the difference between challenges and grants. Um, so just to kind of reiterate, so prize money from challenges differs from funding awarded through grants um, in that they are not, it is not um, uh, subject to the same reporting requirements as a grant usually is. Um, in saying that, prize winners will need to ensure they comply with you know, regular documentation procedures for audit purposes or for any other kind of local or state reporting requirements they, that they would usually need to meet. Uh, we've also just received another question live about whether the results of the competition will be made public for each phase. Um, so we will not be sharing specific feedback or scores publicly, but we will be sharing um, the names of finalists in phase one and then also the prize winners in phase two. Uh, we had a couple of other questions um, back to coming back to eligibility. Uh, so there was one around um, if you are serving as a judge, um, whether you your organization is permitted to enter. So if that is the case, judges will need to recuse themselves from the panel. Um, all judges will be required to submit uh, a signed conflict of interest forms and any potential conflicts of interest will need to be disclosed and discussed with the challenge organizers. So judges will not be permitted to serve on the panel if their organization submits to phase one. Uh, we had another question here um, coming back to the submission requirements, um, which was just around a page limit for the proposal. Um, so yes, there is, um, it is 12 pages. Um, there are specific sort of font and spacing requirements and things like that. Um, they are outlined on challenge.gov and I'll see if a, a colleague can post the details in the chat 
Um, but yes, there is a page limit for the proposal. There is also some information. So I believe that the um, entrant overview, there's a limit of one page there. So that is um, separate to the intervention proposal. And that's just the, the upload that needs to outline um, how your organization meets their eligibility requirements. Um, but again, I'll, I'll ask a colleague to just pop some information in the chat there as there are some specific requirements around the formatting of each um, upload. Uh, we also have a question here about whether the session is being recorded and will be available for um, reviewing. So um, yes, we're recording today's session and we will be um, uploading a link on challenge.gov. Um, we'll also be sharing a copy of the slides. So um, just another plug, if you're not already following the challenges on challenge.gov, I definitely suggest you do that because we'll circulate an update to all of the followers um, when the recording and the slides are available to view. We have another question here about um, IP rights. Um, there are some specifics around the intellectual property provisions in the rules, terms, and conditions. Um, there is a fair bit of detail there. Um, so I would encourage, rather than me reading out specifics, um, that you take a look at those rules. And again, I'll ask a colleague just to pop a link into the chat um, to the specific rules so that you can um, take a look at the, the IP provisions there. Uh, we have another question here about NWEA's role. Um, so NWEA will be conducting all the analysis and reporting and therefore product developers and providers will not need a third party evaluator or researcher. Um, that is correct. Um, so NWEA have been engaged essentially as the, the evaluation partner for this challenge. Um, so they will be leading the evaluation um, and collecting the student performance data through the two assessments. Um, I mentioned earlier too, there will also be um, a technical assistance provider, Apt Associates, who could be providing support to intervention providers throughout phase two um, to help you with things like the random assignment, any changes to random assignment and um, the other necessary data collection um, for finalists. We've also got another question here about whether tech startups can apply. Um, so again, I think this relates to the question we had at the beginning around eligibility. Um, so essentially, as long as um, your company meets the eligibility requirements, um, so that is that it needs to be an entity that's registered or incorporated um, and maintains a primary place of business in the United States, um, you should be eligible to apply. So regardless of, of sort of the specific business type, um, you should be eligible. And then we have another question here around the timing of the map growth assessment. Um, so the question here is that it was mentioned that students 2023 map growth score will be compared to their 2022 scores. Uh, does that mean schools must have administered the map growth in 2022 in order to participate? So yes, um, essentially they will need to have administered the assessment prior to the implementation period. Um, so that needs to be before the 1st of November. And then they need to administer it again at the end of the implementation period. And that needs to be before um, the 1st of May, 2023. Um, so again, if you are looking for school partners who are already administering the map growth assessment, um, we encourage you to reach out to the NWA team and they will be able to assist you with matching. Uh, we have another question here, which is, um, it's not clear how long the intervention should be um, and whether NWA is the only outcome of interest. So I can um, answer the first part of that and then I might pass that along to IES in case they've got any additional context around the outcomes um, that, what, that, that we're looking for here. Um, so to the first part of the question, which is how long the intervention needs to be. Um, so the intervention can be structured sort of however um, the inter intervention provider would like, provided it is administered during the implementation period. So it needs to be administered between November 2022 and then April 2023, but the specific duration of that is really up to the intervention provider. 
In terms of the outcomes, um, I think Matt might have already shared um, some additional information in the chat there. Um, so NWA will be used um, specifically to look at the impact criterion, but as Matt has said there, we're also looking at things like cost effectiveness. There are also criterion in um, stage two around things like scalability um, and also looking at things like team um, and feasibility and things. So I would really suggest to kind of get a better understanding of how um, submissions will be assessed that you take a look at the criteria. They're slightly different for phase one and phase two, and then slightly different between the two prizes. Uh, and Naomi's just popped a link to the, the criteria in the chat there as well. Okay, I am mindful of time. Um, I know that there are a few questions we haven't quite got to. Um, so as I said, what we will do is, um, if we didn't get a chance to answer your question today, we will prepare a written response and publish it on challenge.gov. Um, and so I do encourage you to follow the challenges so that you are updated when we do post um, the FAQs as well as the recording of today's session. And then I also just want to plug again that we are hosting two SME webinars as part of the, of the phase one technical assistance. So these webinars are really intended to help uh, intervention providers who are inter interested in entering um, prepare their phase one submissions. So we have one next Tuesday, uh, August 23, which is all about setting up a randomized control trial. And then we have another one uh, on August 30, which is all about conducting cost analyses and uh, implementation planning. Uh, and Naomi has popped a link in the chat to sign up for both of those. Um, and then if you have any additional questions, we also recommend you reach out to the challenge team uh, and the email address is in the chat as well. It's challenge.ies at ed.gov. Right. Um, thank you all so much for attending and for your excellent questions. Apologies if we did not get to yours live. Um, as I said, we'll be publishing answers shortly. Um, please reach out to the challenge team if you have any uh, specific questions in the meantime. Um, we're really thrilled to have you all. Thanks so much, everybody.